thank you to Silver Spun Goods for their support to help make this episode and keep independent podcasting possible. Silver Spun Goods, makers of American-made socks using earth-friendly yarns and pure silver are dedicated to minimizing what goes back into the environment. These socks are crafted using only the finest quality yarns, while the silver in the fiber naturally inhibits the growth of odor-causing bacteria. That means fewer washes and longer-lasting garments. But most importantly, these socks are the coziest socks you'll ever put on your feet. Please visit silverspungoods.com to explore what else they are doing to make our world a better place. And so even something as simple as finding a place to live is so much harder when you don't have good credit. And around 100 million Americans don't have good credit. More and more young people know I should have good credit, but it's so confusing to figure out what they need to do to build that credit. And right now, the number one way that someone's built credit for the first time is to get a secure credit card. Across the board, the interests just aren't aligned with the consumer. And so we've tried to reimagine, you know, how someone could build credit for the first time without having to expose themselves to the risk of getting a credit card. So we offer essentially the first debit card that builds credit. Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani and I'm your host, Padia Iyer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic, and environmental practices. Today we have with us Roger Morris, co-founder of Zorocard. Build credit with a debit card. He joins us from Austin, Texas. Welcome, Roger. Hi, thanks for having me. Most of our listeners are familiar with the format of the show that we follow. We start with some historical background and perspectives of the industry that our guests operate in, and we move on to the industry standards at the present time and potentially the future of that industry. And today we are talking about accessing credit, the use of credit cards, and personal credit source. In our economy, where majority of our expenditures are paid using credit cards, how do we compare with other countries in terms of percentages of uses, like say Germany or Sweden or Norway or China? I actually don't know a lot about how other countries' credit systems work. My experience is definitely very U.S. centric, um, but I know that each country has their own system and there's a lot of differences between each system. If you have a good credit score, let's say in Canada or Mexico, it's hard to bring that credit score with you to the U.S. and there are some companies working on that problem. So who calculates the credit score part? Because that makes you eligible to get a credit card, right? Which is agency? There's three credit bureaus, major credit bureaus. They're called TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And they're all private companies, and they basically compile data on every single consumer in the U.S. that they can. Mm -hmm. And the way they get that data is lenders will send information about each loan to consumers, and then those consumers pay back the loan, and then that gets sent to the credit bureaus. And actually, the way a new credit file is created is when someone gets a loan from a lender and has never gotten a loan before or doesn't have a credit file. A credit file is actually created for someone when new data is being reported on a new person. The score, at least in the U.S., is about 800, right? What does the score mean? I know that a higher number is a better number, but what does it indicate? A good score is anything above 720, basically. That's considered super prime. Mm -hmm. But then there's different bands of credit worthiness, it's called. If you have a score below 580, you're considered deep subprime. And then there's bands in between where you're subprime, near prime, or prime. It's the main factor that lenders look at when they're deciding whether or not you're lend you money and how much interest to charge if they do lend you money. The credit score is the number one factor. So let's start with how can I affect my credit score? What practices can I do to affect my credit score adversely first, say? The way you would hurt your score is if you get a loan and don't pay it back. The lender that you're not paying back would send a report to each of the credit bureaus saying that you haven't paid back your loan that month. So that would start to hurt your credit score. But also like if you have multiple credit cards, you know, in the US system, you have this credit card, which gives you airline miles, this gives you shopping points. Mm -hmm. So if you have multiple credit cards, and even though you pay your bills on time, I've heard that it possibly could affect your scores. 
Right. There's actually five primary factors. The way the score is calculated isn't known publicly, so it's kind of like what people have observed. One of them is the average age of accounts. So if you have older accounts, you're considered more credit worthy and your score will go up. So what happens if you start opening a bunch of different accounts, your average age of accounts will go down, and that's why your score might go down. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, um, this is one of the reasons why I've heard people might pay off a mortgage or something, which has been on their credit report for a very, very long time, and then they'll actually see their score go down because once that is paid off, then it causes their age of accounts to go down. That's what I've heard. Another factor is successful payment history. That one kind of makes sense. Another one which is, is related to the previous one is the amount of credit available. If you have a lot of credit available and you don't use much of it, that's called a low utilization rate. And having a low utilization rate does improve your credit. So that's actually one reason why having more credit cards could be a good thing because it'll show that your total available credit is really high, but you're only using a small percentage of it. And that's typically viewed as a good thing. So you mentioned there were like five factors. So we have three already, which is payment history, your average loan utilization rate, your the amount of the credit that is available to you and the amount that you use. And what are the other two? So then the other one is if you have inquiries. So basically, if you start applying for new loans, every time you apply, the lender will submit what's called a hard credit inquiry, which means that they're pulling your credit information with the intent of underwriting you for a loan. And the credit bureaus store that, and that also goes into your score. So if you're constantly applying for new loans, you'll start to see your score go down. I think the last one was just like how old your accounts are. That's incredible. Like how will an average consumer or even a young person like you even understand how important it is and how to build their credit, right? Yeah, that's that's the thing. Um, it's something that most people don't really understand, but they do know that it's important. Like the, the awareness about the importance of credit has been going up for the last 10, 20 years. More and more young people know I should have a good credit, but it's so confusing to figure out what they need to do to build that credit. And right now, the number one way that someone's built credit for the first time is to get a secured credit card. I got a secured credit card to build my credit for the first time. And that's actually why I started working on this company, Zorro Card. Mm -hmm. Basically, when I went to get my secured credit card, I had to go to the bank in person. I filled out an application. And then when I got the account, I had to deposit $300 in a security deposit, which means I couldn't touch that money. It was basically stuck in this account until I closed it. And then each month, I could only spend up to $300. But as you'll recall, when we were talking about the factors that affect your credit score, if you spend too much of your available credit, you'll have a high utilization rate, which will hurt your score. So if I, let's say I had a $300 line of credit and I ended up spending 200 of it, that's actually going to have a negative impact on my score. Mm -hmm. So basically, it was through that experience that I really kind of realized how inaccessible building credit can be for most people. And then when I was in college, I met my co-founder and he had started this nonprofit that was helping people build credit. And so I really resonated with the mission he was working on. And he proposed this idea for a debit card that would build credit. And we started working on that together. And then junior year of college, we took a leave of absence and started working on it full time. The other impact of not having good credit is that everything gets so expensive. Like our previous guest, Ernan, said, when you don't have good credit, the interest rates that you get are higher than somebody who has a better credit than you. You suffer from overdraft fees, penalties in the banks, and sometimes you cannot even open a bank account. So it is important not just to get the credit card, but your overall well-being to have good credit. Yeah, another one that a lot of people don't even think about is, so I live in Austin and the housing market's crazy here and I'm trying to get an apartment and everybody I apply for wants to know my credit score and it has to be like above 620. Like I do meet that, but there's a lot of people out there who don't. And so even something as simple as finding a place to live is so much harder when you don't have good credit. And around 100 million Americans don't have good credit. So it's a huge problem. And it's also a market that I think has been underserved for a very long time. And that's why we're, we want to try to build something to help serve those people. So explain what exactly Zorro Card does. Yeah, so we offer essentially the first debit card that builds credit. So normally, if you want to build your credit score, you'd have to go get a secured credit card or any kind of credit card. We're able to do that with a debit card. Kind of under the hood, it's structured like a secured credit card, but it's structured differently so that the customer still can use it like a debit card. That means they deposit funds, their balance goes up, they spend funds, their balance goes down, and all of that is happening in real time. So that basically, it's just a safer, easier way for someone to build credit. So how is it different than, say, I buy a Visa gift card, top it up, and use it? How is your 
solution different. With a Visa gift card, anything you do with that would not get reported to the credit bureaus. So we actually had to build a partnership with the bureaus, kind of pitch our product, explain how it works, get their buy-in so that we could start reporting that data. So you spoke to these three big giants. How did you get access to them? A combination of cold emailing and asking for introductions. (laughs) It wasn't easy. It took a very long time. (laughs) Yeah, because even to get your own credit rating from these people until like laws were passed, it was hard to get your own credit scores from TransUnion and all these other folks out there. So I'm really impressed that you were able to build the partnership and uh, communicate the ratings of your customers to them. Right. Yeah. Basically, you're a fintech firm, right? That's correct. Yeah. So what exactly is your USP? What is your IP in this whole solution? So we've kind of innovated like a new type of card. Previously, there was only debit cards or credit cards, and you could pick one. There's also secured credit card, which is a type of credit card, similar to what I got, where you have to put in a deposit and you can't touch that deposit until you close the account. What we did is we sort of brought those two together into a kind of hybrid product where the behavior is just like a debit card, but under the hood, it's sort of structured like a secured card so that we can report that to the credit bureaus. And that had never been done before. That's kind of like what we bring to the table. And also, in order to launch a product like that, you have to have a bank partnership. You have to work with a card network like Visa or MasterCard. You have to work with the credit bureaus. You have to bring together all these different partners. It took us a few years to even get the product live. And we're kind of at the tail end of that effort. So when did you start this effort? Around three years ago is when we took a leave of absence from school to work on this full time Mm -hmm. um, and started trying to figure out what we needed to do in order to make this product into reality. Um, And I will say we were very naive going into it. We thought this shouldn't be too hard. Like (laughs) we'll just find the right partner. A bank will like work with us. Turns out it's very hard to get a bank to work with you. (laughs) Of course. It took a very long time to get to kind of acquire the knowledge and the understanding about how the system works and also just the expertise to to build trust with the right bank. And somebody said 90% of the ideas are not what ultimately the product becomes. You know, when you start, you have all these ideas, you're idealistic and you're going to do all these things. And then when you move on, you kind of have a beachhead market, you have a targeted uh, product more refined product as you go. So we all go in with the starry eyed and thinking that you're going to change the world, but soon reality sets in. Were you ever able to go back and finish your degree? As of now, I have not. I'm still working on Zorro Card full time. What does your family think about that? I think at first they thought that this was going to be like a temporary thing. <laughs> um, and they thought that, oh, you know, this would be a good experience. Take a year or two off of school learn some stuff, um, get some real world experience, and then go back. And then I didn't go back. So I think it took some time, but I think they're kind of on board with the plan now, which is to keep building this company until, you know, until it just runs its course, which I don't think it will. So (laughs) do you have customers right now? What stage is your business in? Yeah. So as of yesterday, we onboarded our first paying customers. We had a beta live for several months where we were just testing out the basic platform and we're reporting data to one of the three credit bureaus right now, Experian, and we're kind of ramping that up at this point. So in the beta stage, how many people signed up? We accumulated a wait list of around 32,000 customers. Um, And these were people who found our website or who saw, we ran some ads to see if people would be interested in this product. And the ad said, build credit with a debit card. And through that, we were able to build a wait list of 30,000 customers. And then when we launched our beta, we only onboarded like 100 or so of those people on the wait list. So who is your typical customer? Is it somebody who cannot get a credit card or who is coming to Zoro's for a Zoro card? Yeah, surprisingly... A large number of people who come to us are people who already have a credit card. In fact, around 45% of people who applied for Zorro already have a credit card. But the reason why they're applying is because they just don't want to use it. They're afraid to use it. And I hear from people all the time that they just don't want to use their credit card because they're afraid that if they overspend or they go into debt, it's going to sort of derail their entire financial life. And if they can't make a payment, it'll end up hurting their score. So this is just like something that people are more comfortable using. You know, debit cards are something that almost everyone is familiar with. Everyone knows how to use. And it's just very simple. So that's kind of why people are coming to us. So your cards, do they offer purchase protections like credit cards? To some extent, it's not as robust as a credit card, but there are definitely baked in protections similar to what you'd get with a credit card. Yeah.
Silver Spun Goods is a woman-owned business and community supporter. They make products that are kind to your skin, kind to the environment, and kind to the community. To learn more about this mindful business, visit silverspungoods.com. And so with the beta, you refined your product, and yesterday was the first time that you actually had a paying customer. So how many employees do you have? Right now we have six. And you're registered in Indiana as a Delaware C Corp. So that brings us to funding. Where did you get your initial funding? You said you ran some ads. So where did you get money for the ads? The very first money we got was from my co-founder. His name is Zach. His grandparents ended up cashing out like $40,000 or so from their retirement. <laughs> and they let us use that <laughs> to get, get our start. So without that, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And fast forward, how much funding do you have right now? Yeah, now we've raised a total of just under three million, um, and that was across two venture rounds. So we we raised a pre-seed, uh, let's see, a, two years ago, and then we raised a seed round a year ago. How hard was this whole process? How many versions of pitch decks did you have to make to get past the friendly grandfather or grandparents? Over the years, I think we've iterated our deck probably. 150 times or so. We've gotten a lot better at it now, so I think we could probably go out. Uh, like our the seed round we raised, we only did a couple drafts, but early on when we were kind of figuring out what to do and how to do it, and didn't really know anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we were doing was just kind of working on our deck, which in retrospect was probably there's probably better things we could have spent our time on, but at the time that's what we thought we needed. If you take your initial product to what you have right now, what are the some things that were eliminated or things added or any changes in your product? Yeah, when we were starting out, we were very exploratory in terms of what we wanted to build. And we, we were kind of I mean, being totally new to banking. We had a lot of big ideas about, oh, we're going to completely change the banking experience from the ground up. In addition to this, core, like the core ideas never change. It's the debit card that builds credit. You know, a debit card is tied to your checking account. And how can we reimagine what a checking account's like? And we had all these somewhat ambitious ideas of, of gamifying the savings account experience specifically where, you know, the interest generated would like, you know, create like rewards and all these other things that would basically make banking feel like a game. <laughs> you know, the goal of that would be to make, you know, using your money responsibly as easy and as fun as possible. So early on, like we came with all these ideas and mock-ups and we were pitching it like, but <laughs> as we came to find out, just launching the core idea, it was really difficult. So <laughs> we had to take a step back. So that was your 19-year-old from the dorm room view. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a really good lesson for all startups to not get disheartened and to kind of hone in. And uh, But you also need an ecosystem for your startup to exist and help it move forward. So what is the ecosystem that you operate in and how are you getting feedback on your pitches and how is it working? I think one of the, the things that I was very privileged by in terms of the timing of when we started this is that a lot of like startup communities have been moving online. So maybe 10 or 20 years ago, you'd have to be in Silicon Valley to be around the right people to do something like this. But when we were starting out, there was I got added to a Slack community that was like a bunch of fintech people. And some of the really successful and accomplished fintech founders were in that group. And it's through that that I met a lot of the network that I now have and started to accumulate the knowledge that I needed in order to, to make this product a reality. So I think that was a huge benefit, is just having access to those people without being in the same geographic location. Where do you make the money in this whole thing? The primary revenue source is a subscription fee. That's unique to us. I mean, a lot of banks in particular monetize through overdraft fees and other types of fees that are kind of not transparent on the front end. They start to charge fees over the course of using the product when you make mistakes or you overspend or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas we just want to be upfront about like, this is what it costs. <laughs> um, it's not free to offer someone a bank account. So we'll just charge that up front and then there's no hidden fees on the back end. How much are your subscriptions normally? We're kind of testing out different price points and what makes the most sense. So anywhere between three and $7 at this point is what we're looking at. And it would be a flat fee whether I have $1,000 on my Azuro card or $300. Yeah, exactly. You could use it like a normal bank account. And then every month there would be a subscription. Why not uh, a percent of like transactions, like your 
in your trading accounts or percent of your balance. Why do you have this flat fee? I think it's easier to understand. That's how most people pay for the services they use, whether it's Spotify or Netflix, or I think just as a consumer, a subscription is the easiest and most logical way to pay for a service. There are banking regulations as to who is allowed to take a deposit and who's allowed to perform as a bank. Yeah. How are you allowed to do it? We're not. Um, we work with a bank partner that is FDIC insured, chartered in California. Almost any company you see that offers a sort of financial product is either working with a bank or they had to go through the long, arduous process of getting their own bank charter, which then makes them a bank. Talking about FDIC insured accounts, how do I know that the money that I give you is secure? So there is that FDIC guarantee, which means that any amount you deposit up to 250000 is insured in the case that the bank becomes insolvent. So they pass on that insurance and assurance to you? Exactly. Yeah. Technically, the, the bank is the one holding the deposits. We don't. What we technically are is the technology layer between the customer and the bank, but the, the bank is actually the one owning the deposits and managing that. So you said your partner was working in a nonprofit helping people build credit. How do these credit cards, which are supposed to help you match your income as against the expenses, how do they become a source of um, hardship, I would say? Like, how does it impact the consumer? It's a great question because credit cards, maybe surprisingly or not, are actually one of the most profitable products in the financial industry. Even during the, the recession, during, while banks were hemorrhaging money because of subprime mortgages, subprime credit cards were still making them a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that, if you look at like what the revenue sources are for credit card companies, 70% of the revenue is actually coming from fees and interest. So that means that 70% of what they're making is from people who aren't paying their full balance from month to month. Um, and if you actually look at like the statistics on how many people carry a balance, it's kind of stunning, honestly. You'd think that kind of common sense would say, you know, the best way to use a credit card is to spend what you can afford and then pay off the full balance every month. But surprisingly, only about 50% of consumers do that across the board. And even among the prime customers, so the people who have the best credit scores, who you'd expect to be behaving the best, only 70% of them pay their full balance every month. Those are shocking numbers. Yeah. And the majority of people aren't actually using a credit card the way you'd think you should. And that's why people like, um, have you heard of Dave Ramsey? No, I haven't yet. He's one of the biggest like personal finance gurus in the US, you could say. Like he, He's got a radio show and best-selling books. And so people go to him for financial advice. And one of his key messages is don't ever, ever get a credit card. Like, I actually have a, a quote from his website where it says, because one of the points on his website is like, if I plan to pay off my credit card every month, can I get a credit card then? And he says, even if you promise to pay it off every month, all it takes is one lost or missed payment to make your situation exponentially worse. If that happens, your interest rate skyrockets, your credit score drops, and you get slapped with fees. With just one mistake, you've gotten yourself into a big money mess. So that's kind of a key part of his message is like, stay away from credit cards. And honestly, it's kind of knowing the statistics, it's kind of easy to understand why. Because like I said, so many people are actually carrying a balance and starting to accrue interest. And if you miss a payment, not only is that hurting your score, you're also paying late fees, which then goes towards the credit card company's bottom line. So across the board, the interests just aren't aligned with the consumer. And so we've tried to reimagine you know, how someone could build credit for the first time without having to expose themselves to the risk of getting a credit card. So basically, you're saying that your product will help you build a credit score without the risks of a credit card. Right, right. With the typical risks. Part of the risk of a credit card is like, just from a behavioral science standpoint, people tend to make the minimum payment. Like it's just like when you get your credit card bill in the mail, you see your statement and there's a big minimum payment number and you see, oh, I, I only have to pay 25% of the total amount owed. That's easy. So you just pay the minimum payment because it's the most obvious number. And of course, there's a reason why that's the most prominent number on your statement, because that's what they want you to pay. Because the, the ideal customer for a credit card company is someone who continues to make their minimum payment and then accrues tons of debt over time, but still makes payments. And that's actually what they're optimizing for. That's why sometimes credit card companies will, without asking your permission, they'll increase your credit limit, mm -hmm. which on the surface seems like a great thing. Like, of course, you know, why wouldn't you want more, a higher credit limit? Um, that does have a good impact on your credit score. But what they found is that when they do that, people's spending also increases in proportion to how much the credit limit increases, regardless of whether or not they can afford it. So it's another incentive for credit card companies to basically tweak their products in ways that increase the likelihood that someone will get into trouble financially. 
So they prey on you failing. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. Even some of the companies that have really tried to get away from that and have really tried to make their products more user friendly and make the payments easier, there's still this perverse incentive where your biggest money makers are the people who aren't doing well financially. And it's just a really hard problem. And so we've tried to structure a product where that incentive doesn't exist for us. We don't, our product doesn't have any interest associated with it. There's no late fees, there's no fee. So we don't profit when someone does badly. In fact, if someone is doing bad financially, you know, more likely to go towards more predatory financial products, and then we might lose them as a customer. So it's actually in our interest to make sure that people are doing well. Another reason why I think subscriptions are a good business model, because it sort of removes those misaligned incentives. Our goal is to make our customers happy, because then they'll keep paying us the subscription. And then you have a fixed amount every month. You know, it's not this... Exactly. Yeah, you, you can plan for it. There's no unexpected, you know, like an overdraft fee. Chase still charges like $35 <laughs> if you accidentally overdraft. So... Ironically, it costs money to have no money. And that makes your explanation of how credit cards work, that makes your association and onboarding a bank even more of an incredulous task because all banks have credit cards, so they are uh, cannibalizing their own products. That's one reason why a large bank probably wouldn't copy this product is because why would they want to you start offering a product that would cannibalize their credit card business, which is so profitable for them. What's unique about our partnership structure is that we deliberately chose a bank partner that doesn't have that misaligned incentive. Our, our bank partner actually only does partnerships with fintech companies. So they don't actually have their own direct-to-consumer business. They're completely focused on working with fintech companies. Um, it's called Hatch Bank. They work with a couple other new banks as well. And, um, and they've been a really good partner. Um, and I think for a fintech that wants to create something novel and innovative, I think it's really important to have a good bank partner to back you up. So the hottest topic right now are cryptocurrencies and the majority of the ownerships of these cryptocurrencies are 18 to 40 year olds. So about 58% to 90%, depending on what report you read, even 58% is a really high ownership for 18 to 40 year olds to own cryptocurrency. So how will it affect ZoroCard? Yeah, I think crypto as a whole is going to change the financial landscape. It's not clear to me yet exactly what those changes are going to be and which ones we need to bet on, because I think unique to the financial services industry, well, it's not unique just to financial services, but it moves kind of uniquely slowly compared to other industries. And that's due to the amount of regulation and the amount of sort of friction there is to, to changing things. So I do think that in for the, maybe the next five to 10 years, banking will look largely the same for most people. I um, mean, they're kind of there's going to be these like fringes of crypto that starts to work its way into the mainstream. And eventually, I think some of those crypto products will start to replace traditional products. So when do you guys plan a full launch? A full launch is probably going to happen in the next six months. How many lives do you think you can impact? What are your goals? What are your targets? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that around 100 million Americans are either thin file, which means they don't have enough credit information to really come up with a score, or they're subprime. So there's around 100 million people in the U.S. that I think could benefit from a product like this. Where do you see yourself and ZoroCard in, I want to say, three years? Because we're coming out of the pandemic mm -hmm. and banking is kind of changing right now in so many ways. Where do you see ZoroCard? So really our goal in, over the long term is to build the first self-driving bank account. And this kind of harkens back to the early days when we had these grand visions of <laughs> fundamentally changing how people experience banking and making it, you know, more, first of all, lower friction to use your money properly and also more delightful, more fun. Mm -hmm. And so we've built a lot of sort of the primitive technology, like the basic building blocks that are necessary to offer a wide variety of different products. Like we are starting to build out the, our own bank core, which means that we can issue as many accounts as we want to, as many cards as we want to, and we can sort of connect them in any different way we want to. And kind of the long-term goal is to start building out features that sort of automate an increasing amount of your financial management. So similar to how Tesla is trying to automate the driving, uh, you tell your Tesla where you want to go and then autopilot takes care of the rest. That's kind of where we see our product evolving in the long term. So wishing you all the best 
Roger, and I hope we can meet again when you have had a full launch. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks a lot. You're listening to Mindful Businesses, hosted and produced by Vidya Iyer. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a voice note with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcast. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Lafayette, Indiana. Theme music was composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Caitlin Milligan. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pashricha. This is Vidya Iyer with Mindful Businesses. 